getting set up, if you'd like to go ahead and go to the PDF files that are on the left hand side of the screen for the homeowners and the auto tabs, you can actually print those if you would like to follow along with those pieces of the presentation. It won't be necessary to have those, but they're a great reference point to go back to as we are going through the discussion. I want to introduce myself first off. I'm Kendra Smith with Consultative Insurance Group. We are a nationwide insurance agency located in Columbia. Um, I'm a phone call away if you ever have any questions or if you do have questions about the presentation today. If there are questions or if you'd like to share situations that you've had in your own life, please feel free to use the question and answer piece at the bottom of the screen and we'll be glad to share information there as we go through. I also would like to point out some of the web links that are on the left hand side of the page as well. One is a Meet Our Team video link that will take you to a YouTube site that does allow you to see the members of our team and staff. And then there's also our virtual insurance office which is the consultativeinsurance.com website. Please feel free to peruse that at your leisure at any point in time. And last but certainly not least is the link for the nationwide affinity discount information for the realtors. Many of you may already be aware and already receiving materials from Nationwide and from our agency advising you of that discount, but if you were not aware in the past, you are, as a South Carolina Association of Realtor member, entitled to a special discount on your auto insurance. So if you haven't had more information there and you'd like that, again, please let us or contact your local Nationwide agent and they'll be glad to go through that information with you at detail. Now we're going to actually get started with our insurance basics presentation. So this has actually been a, a very high demand presentation for us because the reality is we all need insurance for one reason or another. And you're in very unique situations because not only do you need insurance, but a lot of times you're going to find yourself either in the middle of a consumer who's trying to purchase a property and their insurance questions that are coming up, or you yourself in your personal life may have very unique situations that come up or questions that come up regarding your insurance needs. There are a lot of misconceptions out there, so we're just going to simplify this today. We're going to get started first with auto insurance information. And again, this worksheet that pops up here for you is actually the very same one that is in the PDF link on the left hand side of our screen. You can use this to follow along if you would like, but it's going to be very straightforward. We're going to go right through and start off with the basics of an auto policy. Now everything we talk about is going to be of course related to Nationwide because that's the company that I primarily represent, but most of the things we're going to talk about are going to be standard across the board regardless of who your insurance carrier actually may be. In the liability section here, we want you to get a visual image. Liability coverage is going to be the protection that pays for the damage that you are responsible for to another party. That could be damage to their vehicle, it could also be damage or injuries to that individual and the people in that car, as well as injuries to people in your own vehicle. So if you look at the image to the right, you can see the car is actually damaged. If you are responsible for this accident, we're going to say that's the car that you've hit. Your property damage liability limit is the one that would pay for the damages to this vehicle as well as any other property, like for example a telephone pole that may have also been involved in that particular accident. In the background you can see the uh, firemen slash paramedics taking a person off in an ambulance. Your bodily injury liability limits are the ones that would pay for the damages or injuries to those individuals. On your liability coverage, if you ever look at your insurance page, there's going to be a per person limit for injuries, and then there is a per accident limit for injuries. The per person limit is exactly what it sounds like. It is a limit that is the maximum amount that can be paid to any one person that you're responsible for injuries to in a particular loss. The next number, which actually shows the per accident limit, is regardless of the number of people that are hurt. So if you have a $25,000 limit, which the state of South Carolina allows you to do, it is their minimum limit in the state of South Carolina, what that means is it would pay no more than $25,000 to any one person, no more than $50,000 
per accident regardless of the number of people that are hurt or injured. The next coverage is going to be comprehensive coverage. Now this one used to be referred to as, as commonly acts of God. These are things that are completely out of your control that cause damage to your vehicle. So in this situation, if it's a tree or storm that comes through, hail damage is another very common situation. If your vehicle is stolen, that would also fall under a comprehensive loss. If you have an accident with an animal, that damage would also fall under a comprehensive loss. So you can see we've got a little bit of an extreme situation here, but certainly that one has got to be an act of God type situation or a very bad neighbor who's cut down a tree if that's possible. The next coverage in related to your own vehicle is going to be collision coverage. Collision is basically what it sounds like. If your vehicle collides with another vehicle and your vehicle is also damaged, then collision coverage is the one that's going to pay for the damage to your vehicle, subject to your deductible. Deductibles apply to both comprehensive and collision claims or coverages. Your deductible is the portion that you are responsible for. In, a, in an automobile claim situation, different than a health insurance deductible, for example, with health insurance, if you have a deductible, you only have to meet that deductible typically one time per year, and any expenses that are above and beyond that on health insurance, your deductible doesn't apply again. On comprehensive or collision claims, which are of course related to automobile, or even on homeowners claims, your deductible is going to apply to every specific loss occurrence. So if there are three things that happen in a three month time period, unfortunately each occurrence would be subject to that deductible before your insurance would step in to take care of anything above and beyond your deductible. Okay. So again, in this image, we looked at the same picture originally um, when we were talking about the liability coverage and we said this is the vehicle that you've hit. In this scenario, collision coverage, this would be your vehicle. So if this is your vehicle that's damaged in the accident and you're responsible for the accident, then your collision coverage is actually going to step in to take care of the damages to your vehicle. Okay. The next section is more specific to Nationwide, but there are other companies that offer a similar type of feature too, so I want to make sure you at least have a basic understanding on how a vanishing deductible benefit would work. First of all, regardless of the company, I'm not aware of any carrier that this is a free benefit to, so there is a charge for this specific coverage and it is an optional benefit. If you do have vanishing deductible, and in the scenario on your screen, if I start out with a $500 deductible and I purchase vanishing deductible, immediately my deductible would convert to a $400 deductible. If I go one year without an accident, it reduces that deductible by another $100, so now I have a $300 deductible. I go one more year with no accident, I now would have a $200 deductible. Now I have an accident. My out-of-pocket expense, instead of being my typical $500 deductible that I've selected and that I'm paying for on my policy, would actually only be $200 out of my pocket in this scenario. Then immediately it would go back up for the next loss to a $400 deductible. I will always have at the very least that immediate $100 credit for paying for this benefit. Each situation is different, so there's not a blanket answer of whether or not this coverage is going to be worth it for you. My advice would be take a look at your own policy, talk with your agent, or again, let us take a look at it, and we can make sure that this is an appropriate coverage for you. Bear with me just one second. We've gotten a question in from uh, Columbia Real Estate. I just want to take a quick look here. The question is, real estate agents who drive clients and customers in their personal vehicles to view properties, what type of insurance would cover injuries to those passengers? That is a great question. I'm going to start with that one first before we get to the second piece as well. Realtors are a very unique situation and you're very similar to insurance agents in terms of we just are going to have situations where we're carrying customers in our cars. They may not be in their own vehicles. Does it increase our risk? Absolutely. My best advice there is going to be, as a realtor, 99.9% .9 of the time you need to make sure that your liability limits are going to be the maximum available and that you get a personal umbrella liability policy, which we're going to go into a little bit later here today in more detail. Um, you would be responsible, if you're responsible for an accident, you would be responsible for the injuries to those passengers in your vehicle. Now, depending on your insurance company, they may allow you to keep your vehicle on a personal lines policy and simply qualify it as business use. 
but there are some insurance companies that may require you to move to a true commercial policy if you're consistently carrying passengers in your vehicle. Nationwide, to answer this question, will allow individual business use there, which just basically says you're a little bit higher risk than typically just driving your vehicle back and forth to work but it's not necessarily so much of a commercial risk that they require you to have a commercial policy. For the second part of this question, if you use your vehicle for work, must you carry additional or different insurance beyond what covers a typical non-work vehicle? Absolutely. Anytime you're using your vehicle, For anything other than driving back and forth to work, you have an additional risk exposure. Insurance is always is going to be all about risk. So just keep that in mind, whether we like it or not. Some days. Um, if you have anything that indicates you have a higher than average risk, average being I get in my vehicle each morning, I drive to my office, I park my car, it sits the majority of the day, I come back at night, get in my car and drive it back home, go out to dinner every now and then. That's pretty typical use of a vehicle. If it's above and beyond that, you probably do have an additional liability risk exposure that you want to make sure that you're insuring correctly. Definitely talk with your insurance agent if you're not sure whether or not you're protected correctly. And if you see that your vehicle is showing a pleasure use when you know that you're really using it, particularly as the realtors would be with other vehicles in there or other passengers in their car, you definitely want to get that adjusted and make sure you've got that protection. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that question. Great question. The next coverage is going to be un- and underinsured motorist coverage. In South Carolina, we are required to have uninsured motorist coverage. We are not required to purchase underinsured motorist coverage, but very candidly, any insurance agent worth their salt needs to be telling you to purchase underinsured motorist coverage. Uninsured motorist coverage, the first, which is the state required, is protection for you if somebody else hits your vehicle, they are at fault for the accident, and you are either injured or your vehicle is damaged. Your company steps into the shoes of the company that that person should have if they are uninsured to make sure that your vehicle repairs are taken care of and also to make sure that there is protection or coverage for your injuries and injuries to the people in your vehicle. The question I usually get here is, well, does that mean the person just gets away with this if they're driving without insurance? Absolutely not. The responsibility then goes back to the insurance company to pursue that individual on your behalf. When we say pursue, what can happen to someone who's driving without insurance? They can have liens placed against their future earnings. They can have judgments placed against them. They can, we can seize actual future and, and potential current um, belongings or properties. Uh, it is not a good situation. So there, in addition to all the state penalties that that individual would be facing, are a number of different penalties that would be in place simply because they've caused a damage or an injury that they are not taking financial responsibility for. Underinsured motorist coverage is a unique situation. Underinsured is still protection for you if someone else hits you and they are responsible for the accident. In this situation, they do have insurance coverage. It's just not enough to take care of either all of your damages to your vehicle or all of your injuries. And injuries is probably the most common situation that we see here. In this situation, if you've got a severe accident or even a moderately severe accident, and that other driver that's responsible has those state minimum limits of $25,000, what I usually ask people is stop yourself for one moment. If you yourself could not work for the next six months, so let's not make it really severe, let's just make it a temporary scenario, and you are going to be responsible for all of your medical expenses, how long do you think $25,000 worth of coverage would last? 
If you know that that's not even going to be a drop in the bucket and the average cost of one night stay in the emergency room is $25,000, then you understand the need to make sure that you've got additional protection under your own policy if those other drivers on the road are not correctly insured for the risk that they do damage or injury to you. So it's an extremely important coverage. In this situation, we can kind of laugh and say, Probably the person to the right in the older vehicle may not have enough even just property coverage for the damage to the car that they caused to the left. At least that Ferrari owner would know there's somewhere to actually start, even if there were no injuries in this loss. The next piece gets a little further into injuries, which is medical payments coverage. In South Carolina, you may have personal injury protection coverage or medical payments coverage, depending on your insurance carrier, but they do work overall in a similar manner. Nationwide actually has medical payments, which is why we're looking at this. In medical payments, if I am the driver responsible for an accident, and I am also injured in that accident, medical payments is the only coverage that will help step in to take care of my injuries. Liability coverage, which we talked about in the beginning, is going to take care of injuries to all those other individuals that I've caused injury to. But unless I've got a health insurance policy, I may have a complete gap in protection if I don't have medical payments coverage. Medical payments coverage can go hand in hand with your health insurance protection by helping cover deductibles in case of injuries related to an automobile accident. But keep in mind, this is not a true health insurance benefit. This is truly for injuries related to an automobile accident. It also would apply if I was a, um, a pedestrian and I was hit by someone else. I could use medical payments in that situation. Or if I was a passenger in someone else's vehicle and if I had medical payments coverage under my own policy. So there are some extending benefits even if it's not something that happens in my personal vehicle. The next one is going to be accident and minor violation forgiveness. Again, this is a little bit more specific to Nationwide, but there are other companies with similar types of features out there. And this is, again, if it's available to you, hands down, I would tell you it is worth the cost every single day of the week because the chance that at some point you are going to have an accident or get a ticket, regardless of how great of a driver that you are, is just there. They call them accidents for a reason, so just keep that in mind. The accident forgiveness will actually forgive up to one accident per household every three years, regardless of the amount that we pay out. So if you have a limit of $50,000 and you cause $50,000 worth of liability damage to someone else, so Nationwide pays out that claim at $50,000. What this means is your rates are not affected by that loss at all. And that's huge. It's absolutely huge. And we see customers that need to use this every single day. The minor violation forgiveness is a second piece to this. This will actually forgive a minor violation for every driver in your household listed on your policy up to one per driver every three years. And again, it is on top of the accident forgiveness. So let's get an extreme situation here. If in my household, my husband and I are both drivers and I have an at-fault accident that we have to pay out damages for, so let's use that same $50,000 that we talked about before. Nationwide pays out the $50,000, then I get a month later a speeding ticket for going less than 10 miles over the speed limit, and we're just having a bad couple of months, my husband gets a speeding ticket for going less than 10 miles over the speed limit the next month. By having this accident and minor violation forgiveness package protection coverage on my policy, our rates are not affected by any of those events. So again, well worth the money there in terms of recommendations. Roadside assistance. A lot of us are familiar with roadside assistance through AAA. That's probably the most common one that we see. And the biggest advantage that AAA has offered in the past is that that coverage not only follows you, but it follows the members of your household. Well, the great news is the roadside assistance coverage that we offer does the exact same thing. There are two different levels. One is the basic limit. In that basic limit, it will basically cover towing and, lim towing and labor expenses for tows up to 15 miles or $75. Now, it doesn't have to be a reimbursement. You actually can call into our toll-free number if you have this kind of a situation, and they will send someone to you and then they'll direct bill nationwide if you have that coverage on your policy. 
The next level up, which is the one we typically recommend and is the most similar to that AAA type protection we were talking about, is the broader coverage or PLUS form. In that situation, the vehicle can be towed as far as up to 100 miles. We can pay up to $300 toward those towing expenses. It does pay for extraction, so if your vehicle is in a ditch, things like that, whatever happened, we, we don't have to have all the details with it. We can still pull you out in those situations, so don't get your neighbor to pull your car out if you're in that scenario. And as well, if you are traveling and you're more than 100 miles from home, it will also pick up motel expenses if you need to stay somewhere overnight, additional meal expenses if those are also incurred because of a mechanical breakdown on your vehicle. Those expenses can be as high as an additional $500 over and above the actual tow expenses. So it's a great coverage. It's very inexpensive. The most that this coverage can cost with us, just so you've got a figure with that as well, is $20 every six months. It does follow all the drivers in your household, just like I was mentioning that the AAA coverage does. So if you have a, a child who's away at college, to me this is the most common one, it doesn't matter if they're out on the road at night with one of their friends and, and their girlfriend's car breaks down and so they're stranded in the middle of nowhere, they still can call the claims office 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're still going to send somebody out to pick them up if you've got this protection on your policy. The next piece, discounts and savings. We always want to know where can I save some money and are there pros and cons to having all of my policies with one agency. I'll use that as an example. First of all, there absolutely are significant pros to having all of your insurance with one company. It is the best way for an insurance professional, as an agent, we are insurance professionals, to really be able to make sure they're consulting with you and making sure that there are no gaps in your overall protection. And that's huge because we see gaps all the time. Particularly the more assets that you have, the bigger the opportunity there are that there are gaps out there. So we want to make sure that we're giving you that advice in the best way possible. Some potential discounts out there you can see home and car, auto financial if we have a life or financial product with you, the nationwide family plan, non-nationwide home ownership. If we don't insure your home or it's not eligible to be insured with us, there are still some potential discounts that are there for you. Accident free, advance quote, so if your policy is not renewing for a month, just say as an example, but if it's more than eight days from now, you actually will get a special discount because you're not waiting until the last minute to shop your information. It's a more consultative, again, approach in this overall picture. New vehicle discounts, multi-car discounts, and terms with prior carrier. So the more longevity, the more stability that you've shown in your insurance history, the better pricing that you can actually get today next piece is going to be the home insurance. So we're going to move to the next PDF that we have available too. So if you are following along with those, um, with those listings, you'd want to flip over to the homeowner's piece now too. The worksheet's here. And this picture, the first, probably the most important piece of insuring your home is of course the dwelling coverage itself. And if you notice in the picture to the right, there's a picture that appears to be maybe a house under construction and that's very much done on purpose. When we're insuring a home, we are insuring it for what it would cost to rebuild that home or reconstruct that home. You guys deal with market value on a daily basis. Mortgage brokers deal with market value on a daily basis. And I'm sure that you've had experiences in your past dealing with insurance agencies or insurance companies where there's a difference in the amount of the purchase price and what they're coming back with as a reconstruction value on the home itself completely common, particularly in times like our economic past recently, where market value, forgive the expression, may be shot to hell, but it's still not necessarily helping on the reconstruction costs. So we want to be careful and make sure we're not over-insuring a home. We want to make sure we're not under-insuring a home. And most companies will have restrictions about insuring a home somewhere close to 100% in replacement cost value. And the, the best recommendation typically is going to be to 100% of whatever that estimated reconstruction value is. Remember too with reconstruction value, if a home goes through an extreme fire loss for example, you're not dealing with a blank slate. So you want to make sure that you understand too in reconstruction, it's also going to be building in that there's going to be something there that's probably going to have to be cleared away or cleaned up before we can truly start reconstruction of the home itself. The next one is other structures coverage. 
Other structures coverage is going to be for things like fences, pools, storage buildings, docks. Also would be for a detached garage. An attached garage, which is literally connected to the house itself, is going to be part of the dwelling coverage. If it is not actually connected to the house itself, regardless of how close that it's actually sitting to the home, it will fall under other structures coverage. Insurance companies have a set percent that will default for other structures coverage. The biggest thing you can do here for yourself and for your customers is make sure that that other structures coverage limit is high enough to protect the things that are there. If I have a default that goes to $10,000 and you can look in their backyard and see there's a $30,000 pool back there, you need to have the insurance agent make that adjustment. Again, whether it's your situation or whether it's your client's situation as well. The next section is contents, and these are actually your belongings or your stuff in the house itself. I, I kind of express it this way to clients sometimes. If I literally could pick your house up, turn it upside down, and shake it, anything that would actually fall out is going to fall under the contents section of your policy. Again, the insurance companies in their standard forms are going to have a set percent that will default here. Remember the defaults are never going to be the most that you can get they're really going to be the minimum that are built into that package. So there's no real use to have a conversation back and forth if your customer or if you don't have as much as maybe that default is. But if you know you have a need for more than what that default is showing, that's where you definitely want to talk with your insurance agent to make sure you're getting that level of protection where it needs to be. Then there are going to be specific items that we're going to recommend kind of going to the next step in terms of insuring them farther than just your contents. You can see in the picture to the right that there's some basic contents things. You've got your furniture. Probably the biggest thing though that we see that clients sometimes forget are the clothes in their closet. You may have a pair of jeans hanging in your closet that are 10 years old that you wouldn't wear out regardless of what happened. At the same time, if you have a fire loss and that same 10 year old pair of jeans is destroyed, we have to replace those. So we're gonna be replacing them with new jeans. So just keep in mind too that that valuation sometimes can escalate very quickly when people don't realize what the insurance company's obligation really is. In contents too, there are two ways to cover your contents. You'll see replacement cost coverage and you may see actual cash value coverage. Let me kind of explain to you very briefly the difference between those. Replacement cost coverage, which we would always recommend, I will tell you my personal opinion, it's not going to be worth the money to have an ACV policy any day of the week. Replacement cost is going to look at an item like a sofa, which pretty much everybody's going to have. And it's going to say, how much is it going to cost you to replace that sofa with the same or most similar available sofa today? Okay, so it's going to pay to replace it exactly like it sounds like. An actual cash value policy will look at that very same sofa and say, okay, Mr. and Mrs. John Doe, how much did that sofa cost you originally? How old is it? And depreciation would be taken off of that original value. So you can hear there's a huge difference in what it's going to pay for. So if you go back or you see that your policy or your client's policies do not include replacement cost coverage, you definitely want to have a conversation here because this is a biggie. You also may have that option on, for example, roofs, home roofs. We sometimes see that there will be ACV coverage on the roof. A lot of times companies will do this to make the pricing of a policy less expensive. But what it really means is, versus putting a new roof on either a section that's damaged or an entire home, if that home has actually got damage to it, an ACV policy would only cut a check to that customer for the reduced amount, so the valuation of their roof minus depreciation for the age of it. So again, huge difference is there to look for. Personal liability. We talked about liability coverage on the auto side, and we said liability is if you're doing damage or injury to someone else. The theory is still the same here, and I don't know how many of you may have cringed when you see the picture to the right with the toys on the stairs, because if you have children, at some point in your life, you've experienced this picture. So if it's you that's walking down the stairs, you can't be liable to yourself. So even though it may really hurt, hopefully the health insurance is going to step in in that particular situation. Where you've got a bigger situation is maybe say your parents are in town visiting and they're the ones coming down the step and now your 80 year old mother has just slipped down on these toys and broken her hip. 
are you liable for those injuries to her? Yes, you may be liable in that situation. So your liability protection on your homeowner's policy is the one that would step in again for injuries that you may be liable for that have happened on your home premises or that you or the members of your immediate household may be liable for even in your personal lives. So intentional acts are usually going to be excluded. So if somebody goes out and intentionally does damage or injury to someone else, there's not gonna be coverage under an insurance policy typically for those scenarios. Um, you're really, again, gonna go back to the theory of accidental. For coverage to apply from most any insurance policy, regardless of the company, the keywords to remember are gonna be sudden and accidental. Where we deal with a lot of the, the claims that are not covered, is, for example, leaks in homes. Leaks are not sudden. Bursting of a pipe is sudden. So these sound like some, some small distinguishments, but if you get into these policy contracts, those are the kinds of things you're gonna look for. So again, sudden and accidental are the biggies, okay? Medical payments on the homeowner's policy. Again, same theory there too. Medical payments under the homeowner's policy would pay for injuries at your home regardless of liability. So let me give you this example. If I'm moving my sofa and I've got a friend over that's helping me move it and they mash their hand in the process, I may or may not really be liable for the injury to them. Medical payments coverage under your homeowner's policy would still step in to take care of those medical expenses for the injury to their hand, regardless of liability. We've got another question that's coming here, so bear with me just one second. This one's again from Columbia Real Estate. For the typical residential seller who lists their property for sale, what type of coverage does this seller need to protect themselves from potential buyers or real estate agents who get injured on the property during viewings, showings, open houses, etc.? Well, I do want to specifically address one piece of this as well because I know you guys deal with this all the time. I'm going to answer this first as if the seller is still living in the house, okay? If the seller is not living in the house, we get into a whole different set of issues. So in this scenario, if the seller is still living in the house, the biggest thing that they want to do is, again, make sure that they've got the right limits of liability protection on their policy. So the minimum that I would recommend for liability is at least a $300,000 limit there. You may see some older policies that still have $100,000 limits on them. It's not a big pricing difference to increase those limits. Typically for us to give a very generic answer, going from a limit of $100,000 on a home's liability to $300,000 may be about a $25 price difference per year. So we're not talking a significant difference for a lot more protection. Again, we're going to talk about personal umbrella liability policies in just a little bit. Personal umbrella liability policies provide an additional million or more dollars worth of coverage. above and beyond both the homes policy and an auto policy. Depending on the situation, there are key things that I would also be looking for with this seller to decide, do they need a personal umbrella policy? First is the amount of their assets. If I'm looking at a half a million dollar home, $300,000 liability limit is not enough. They need to have a personal umbrella policy. If they have a pool, if they also own rental properties, these are some of the big things that immediately to, immediately to me, I need to have the conversation with them that they need that personal umbrella liability limit to get enough protection in their situation. Same thing if they have a youthful driver in their household, and that's a tough one, because if I've got a youthful driver, the chances that they're gonna have an accident are gonna be higher, so my insurance is typically gonna also be higher. But you look at it this way, the way that liability works is every time that that youthful driver gets into your vehicle, every asset that you own is literally sitting on the hood of their car. So in your situation, that seller that's listing their home, every asset that they own is at risk anytime somebody else comes on that property, okay? So again, we're wanting to make sure they've got those right limits of liability protection, and personal umbrella policies are certainly an essential piece of that mix. The medical payments piece that we were just talking about would step in regardless of liability. So again, if it's something minor and you may have someone you're showing the house to and they just have a very minor situation, let's just kind of use the scenario, they cut their hand on a railing, maybe there was just a little um, 
uh, a splinter on a railing. So nothing major. They just want to go to the doctor, make sure everything is okay. Medical payments may be able just to take care of that without even getting into the liability side of it. But medical payments is typically going to be limited to like a, a $1,000 to $5,000 limit. It's not designed for the big stuff. The big stuff is where you're going to get into the liability exposure. Great. Another very good question. Thank you very much. I do want to backtrack one second. I apologize. As I mentioned in the beginning, it does make a difference if the, if the homeowner is no longer living in the home. There is a difference for us even between a secondary residence, a rental property, or if it's a true vacant home. If there are no belongings in that home anymore, if it's truly there's nobody living there, there's nobody staying overnight there once every 30 days or so. So the only person who's really coming and going on this property is maybe you as the realtor to show it. That is really a vacant home at this point. And there are a lot of carriers out there that are going to have specific exclusions when that home is vacant beyond certain time periods. That could be at 30 days, it could be at 60 days, it could be at 90 days typically. What happens is when a home is vacant for 30 days, there are immediately some coverages that drop off. Your vandalism coverage and your malicious mischief. And your malicious mischief is kind of in that same scenario. Somebody comes into the home itself and maybe does some minor damage to it. Um, also falling under this category would be someone coming in and stealing copper pipes, which unfortunately happens with some of these properties as well. In those situations, if they do not have a vacant home policy, they could not have coverage in those scenarios. So the liability is a little bit more flexible in terms of the insurance carrier, would they pay a liability claim in that scenario? But damage to the home becomes a huge issue if there's not somebody actually living in that home on a regular basis. If it's a secondary residence, there's still contents in there. They live in one state half of the year and in another state the other half of the year. Typically, you're going to be okay in that situation, but understand if there is a claim, the, the carrier is going to come back in and ask, how long has this home been vacant? Okay, And it can be a big issue. Water claims are huge in this particular area, and there are a lot of limitations on whether or not there's coverage for water claims. Um, if that home has been vacant, for example, over 60 days. So advising your clients that they need to make sure that their home is insured correctly. You're not getting anything over on the insurance company. Vacant home policies are typically more expensive than a traditional homeowner's policy. There's a reason for that. Remember I said in the beginning, insurance is all about risk. The risk is higher on a vacant home because there is not anyone living in that residence. No matter how often people are quote unquote checking on it, it's still a different risk than if somebody's actually living in the home itself. So vacants are huge. Just so you know this too, because I think some people don't realize this, Nationwide itself will not write a vacant home property. Most major carriers will not write a vacant home property. However, one of the advantages that we offer at Nationwide is we have the ability to broker through other companies. So if you have a customer who has a vacant home situation and they're having difficulty being able to find coverage, that is definitely something that we would be able to help with and we have many avenues in that regard as well. Great question. Loss of use coverage. Loss of use is for temporary living expenses while your home is either being repaired or rebuilt due to a covered loss to the home itself. So worst case scenario, and I'm going to knock on wood when I say this, if my home were to burn, while it's being rebuilt or repaired, they would pay for me to actually live in a hotel or rent a comparable home in that interim time period. Um, I would still be responsible for my mortgage payments, and a lot of people don't understand that. So the key is, I'm still responsible for my mortgage payments, but it's those additional expenses that are covered under the loss of use coverage here. So meals, because I can't cook in my own kitchen anymore, I would actually pick up some additional coverage for things like that as well. Ordinance or law. I know you guys understand this, but the laws always change, particularly when it comes to the construction side of the business too. So if I have a 50 year old home that now has gone through a loss and I have to rebuild it back to current code and there's an additional expense to do that, ordinance of law coverage actually will help me provide that additional coverage in order to make sure that if I have to bring it up to current code, I've got some coverage built in my policy that's going to pay for those expenses. Other coverages, let's go a little bit further here, water backup. 
Water backup coverage is an optional coverage and it is not automatically built into most homeowners policies. I can't think of any company off the top of my head that automatically builds it in. If you have a customer who has a basement in their home, hands down, no question, they should absolutely have water backup protection. Water backup protection would pay if your septic tank or your sewer lines actually back up and that causes dirty water to come into the house itself. So water backup is really from an inside source versus flood insurance, which is really rising waters from an outside source. So there are differences here. You can see in the pictures to the right, there's kind of two of our worst case scenarios, right? First, nobody ever wants to walk in and see their toilet doing what's happening on the far right hand side. But again, water backup coverage would pay for any damage that's caused to those personal belongings that may be in that same bathroom. Water backup will not actually pay for whatever's caused the problem unless that's also a covered loss. So let's just say a pipe bursts. Why did it burst? And again, the pipe may not be covered. All the resulting damage would be covered in that situation. So when I'm saying that a part of it might not be covered, it may be, again, that burst pipe, the replacement of that pipe may not be covered unless whatever burst it is a covered loss or a covered peril in that situation. The other situation to the right is probably typical if you've got a sump pump that's failed in a basement. If that sump pump fails in that basement and you get the flooding scenario like you have in this particular picture, again, backup is going to be the only thing that's going to step in to take care of those damages. There are different levels of backup coverage available. And again, the amount that we would recommend would vary depending on what you have in that base. Space. If it is a finished space. Then obviously you're going to need a higher limit of protection. Then if you've just got your hot water heater, your water washer and dryer maybe in that basement space where you're really looking at true just basics. Okay, next is identity theft protection. This one, in my opinion, is also huge. Identity theft right now is one of the highest rising crime rates in the U.S. This is if somebody's stealing your social security number, your date of birth, your personal information. Impersonating you. Any Those cases. The identity theft protection under nationwide policy will actually pay up to
$25,000 to help restore your identity. So it doesn't mean that you're for those charges of whatever but a lot of times you may have attorney's fees for example just to get something cleared up and if you've ever gone through one of these scenarios, probably the worst part of it is the hours upon hours that it takes of phone calls just to get these scenarios cleared up. What Nationwide did is we partnered with a company that specializes in identity theft protection. So if you have that type of a loss, you immediately get referred to an expert who will actually assist you through that whole process and help you to do things like make all of those phone calls, doing the national fraud reporting, et cetera, so that you're not held responsible for something that you clearly had no responsibility. Too. The other perks here as well is um, you can also. identity theft monitor credit monitoring services included with the coverage with us you actually do service for one person And at a nominal you can actually pick up the Social Security number. of additional individuals in your household. So we'll get you a free as well each year. 
And I know from your positions, you guys understand the importance of monitoring your credit and how much that can really impact an individual. fantastic. I've had it from day one. that it became available. And again, versions of it will vary. from one company to the next. Please don't assume if you do have identity Coverage yours will work exactly the same way that I just described. Very candidly, Nationwide has got one of the best identity theft protection packages on the marketplace. And if your home is also insured with us, this particular coverage costs you $45 for the year and is worth every penny. Great. The next one is earthquakes. Now, the good part is. We never have earthquakes, right? And we're not on a fault line or any of those things. Um, if you're if you're not shaking. Of course we are. Of course we are. So we want to be careful, even in the Irmo area. Which is where our main office is located. Um, in the last 15 years that I've owned the agency, we've had two to different times that there have at least been minor trim. Understand, earthquake damage coverage is not, not something that's automatically built into a homeowner's policy. It is an optional coverage, again, regardless of the company. So you want to make sure, particularly If you have a brick home, 
A brick home is going to be at a higher risk in terms of earthquake damage coverage. Just because uh, brick doesn't move very easily. Versus in fire law, is typically a frame home. is going to be a higher risk category. Brick or a masonry home too. So again, Keep in mind that earthquake damage coverage is not automatic, and it typically will have a different deductible than your standard homeowner's deductible. So if I have a thousand dollar Well, my homeowner's policy. This one could be a percentage deductible instead, like a 10%, for example. Um, so just keep that in mind. And while we're on deductibles there for a second, I would also recommend too, typically right now a $1,000 deductible is probably the most standard homeowner deductible that we're seeing on new business. A lot of customers don't understand the higher your deductible is, the lower the price of the policy is. There's also a big misconception because you don't want to file small claims. Insurance is designed for catastrophic losses. It's not that we can't use it for the other things, but when you do, that's one of the things that affects the overall pricing for insurance products too. So if you know you're not going to turn in a claim that's less than $1,000 worth of damage, then put your deductible at $1,000 so it saves you money in the interim and at the same time, again, prevents you from feeling frustrated if you're not filing those smaller claims. I always use the example of if you drip paint across your living room carpet and it was going to cost $750 to replace it, would you turn that claim in? And my answer is going to be you wouldn't want to if you wouldn't do it for less than $1,000. So again, put your deductible where you feel like your, your threshold would be for a comfort level. If you're not sure what your deductible is, your agent can run some different scenarios so that you can see some of those pricing differences as well. On the home side, discounts and savings here too. Home car discount, claims free discount, home purchase discounts, you guys have to like that one. Protective devices, um, home renovation. I want to back up to protective devices. We get this question a lot. Um, is the discount worth me getting an alarm system for my home? What I usually say to people is if you're going to get an alarm anyway, then the discount's a great additional perk. But it is not going to cover the expense of getting the alarm to actually get that alarm system. So if I'm, I'm putting the discount on there, I may get a 12% total deduction off of my homeowner's policy. That 12% is not going to cover the monitoring fees for that alarm system as well. So again, use your good common sense in that situation, but it is a nice perk and a nice advantage if you're already going to be getting an alarm system or there is an alarm system that's going to be monitored in the home itself. Home renovation discounts. This is another biggie. If you've got a home that's at, that you're working with a customer on, or even again your personal home here too, if there are renovations done by a licensed contractor, so it's it really doesn't work as well when it's mom and pop doing it themselves, but if they're going through and they're doing some renovations, some of the major ones, a new roof, the electric has actually been completely rewired. Those are some of the biggest ones that we see. Then there are discounts in addition to the regular pricing for the policies that could help with pricing on these homes as well. Age of the insured and is it a gated community? Tenants and condos insurance, I'm going to slip through this a little bit faster because unless it applies to you personally, you're probably not going to be dealing with as much of this. But the biggest thing on condo policies in particular that we see that gets missed is the additions and alterations coverage. 
Conditions and alterations coverage is going to be the coverage that pays for the upgrades that that individual has actually done to the home. So let's run through a quick scenario. If I purchased a condo and that condo was just very basic, standard walls, with vinyl floors with carpet in it, so let's really keep it extremely basic. And I moved into that condo and for me this was a long term move, so I wanted to go in and upgrade my floors to a travertine tile and I wanted to upgrade my countertops to granite countertops and I put in a higher quality carpeting and then that complex burns. The additions and alterations coverage is going to be the piece that helps pick up those additions and alterations that I added to that property in order to make sure that I'm really being put back whole after a loss. So again, if they are going in and doing some different upgrades, we want to make sure that this limit is actually high enough and very candidly, we see this one underserved all the time. So this is a big one to watch out for if you're dealing with a condo situation. Flood insurance. I mentioned earlier we were going to come to this piece and that flood insurance is different than water backup. You guys probably know a little bit more about flood insurance than the average consumer does. But the bottom line is everyone is in a flood zone. It does not matter whether the area that you live in has actually been flooded or not. Flood insurance policies will not and should not have different prices from one company to the next. Why? Because flood insurance policies are